introduce at this stage our second speaker, who is Per Albert. Per obtained his PhD in zoology from the University of Cambridge in 1989. After five years as a departmental lecturer in the zoology department at the University of Oxford, he joined the paleontology department of the Natural History Museum in London and as a member of research staff in 1994. In 2003, he returned to his native Sweden to become professor of evolutionary organism, organismal biology at Uppsala University. Per's main research area is the origin and early evolution of tetrapods, the land vertebrates. He has discovered and identified six of the 11 known fossil tetrapods from the Devonian period, including Alginer Patton Pankeny, Maybe mm -hmm. that's the right expression, <laughs> right term, which is the earliest tetrapod known from the fossil records. His recent works include determining the origin of the tetrapod internal nostril in the posterior external nostril of fishes and in collaboration with uh, some colleagues in London, he is integrating data from comparative morphology and polyontology with transgenic permanent cell lineage labeling in mouse and xenopus in order to investigate the evolution of developmental patterning units in the vertebrate head, neck, and middle ear. So, Per, we'd like to ask you to survey the next stages, and perhaps you will not continue exactly where that left stopped, but we hope to cover a large area and reach the land that Thank, Thank you. you. Oh. Thank you. While we get my computer on, up, I would just like to start by, by um, uh, expressing my, my thanks for being invited to, to this very, very exciting lecture series. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. No, all right, okay, I'll carry on with the rest of it. Okay. Um, so I am going to, broadly speaking, uh, take on here, take up the story uh, where Detlef left off, or, or, or very, very shortly afterwards, um, by looking at one particular bilaterian group, the vertebrates. Thing with vertebrates, well, I mean, look, you know, vertebrates, we're vertebrates, eh? there's always a, you know, inherent level of interest, but there's a bit more to vertebrates than just that. Vertebrates show a very wide range of body forms and lifestyles. Everything you're seeing on here is a vertebrate, including those um, peculiar black things there. Now, then, which is the... Aha, uh -huh. there we go, yes. Um, we really are quite a distinctive group of animals. We have this vast range of forms. We also include, with the exception of giant squid, admittedly giant squid are fine animals, but they're a bit of a standalone among the mollusks. With the exception of giant squid, all the largest animals on the planet of vertebrates, both now and in the geological past. And of course, they include the most cerebralized, if you like, of all animals, including, of course, ourselves. Nonetheless, we form a natural group or clade. You can see the theme here is going to be rather light. That looks, but I thought I'd put some curves into my line, so, you know, just to add a bit of variety and interest of the presentations today. So anyhow, we are all closely related. So the sort of themes that I want to take up today, I'm going to essentially riff on this image here, this tree uniting all these very disparate vertebrates, and take up a few points that I think are interesting in vertebrate evolution. Because as you can see, when we have this kind of situation, a group of related organisms with essentially a shared body plan, but an enormous range of actual morphologies and lifestyles, this is rather a nice sort of test case for looking at evolution full stop. And there are some themes I'd like to take up relating to this. How do you build this kind of body? What were the steps that we went through? How did a diversity of vertebrates evolve from this range of, of, of body plans? And how did this contribute to assembling the world, the whole biological world, as we know it today? 
I'm going to start with looking at the origin of vertebrates, then go through a bit which we can consider as this as a bit, you know, martial and dramatic, but no matter the conquest, the conquest of the waters, you get the idea. Diversification of, of aquatic vertebrates, the move from water to land, and briefly at the end I will look at the birth of the modern groups and kind of look forward a little bit to what happened afterwards. In very broad terms, the time frame I'm looking at is going to be between about 500 million years ago, and actually going back a little bit in time before that, and my frame of reference will end at about 250 million years ago. The stuff that Detlef was telling you about, both in terms of the tree pattern and in terms of time, lies approximately down here. But I want to do a little more than that as well, because, you know, this is all very well, and we can look at this tree, and we can talk glibly about these sorts of dates. But we shouldn't forget that what we're actually talking about here is a very ancient and, to us, very, very strange world. This is the Earth 370 million years ago. No clouds are shown, but other than that, this is like an accurate reconstruction. And immediately you can look at this and say, well, you know, I can't recognize a thing. You know, where are we? We can put on some flags. Doesn't help very much, does it? You can begin to see that Europe is somewhere in here. This is where I came from the day before yesterday. This is Sweden in here somewhere. British Isles, this is Spain. Here, evidently, we have the Americas, Mexico, the US, Canada, but there's no Atlantic. Um, this bit is Greenland, in case you don't recognize the flag. Russia goes into two bits, because where we now have the Ural Mountains, you have an, an arm of the ocean. Bits of China here, and a number of other countries, you can recognize Brazil, India, Australia, forming part of a southern supercontinent, Gondwana. Of course, a natural question in present company is, where is Singapore? Well, somewhere around the back, rather difficult to locate precisely. So this is the layout of the planet. Well, at this particular time point, the continents, of course, are moving slowly over time. So within the time frame I'm dealing with today, even this picture changes quite a lot. And incidentally, by the way, this is in a conventional orientation. So the equator is about here. You can see that uh, the United States, Canada, and Scandinavia are equatorial regions at this time. And what a world it is. We're going to encounter organisms such as these spires, about four or five meters tall in reality, perhaps. Prototaxitis, they call it probably a giant fungus, but we don't even know for certain. Um, strange fauna in the seas, you know, giant sea scorpions. A human being in this picture would be about as big as that fellow there, you know, so you know, not a place to go swimming. Weird, giant armored fish like Dunkleosteus. All right, well, look, to a degree, this is kind of familiar stuff to anybody who's kind of watched. Uh, you know, popular nature documentaries about the evolution of life. Um, and this is the world in which our story will be playing out, but there's something else we want to stop and think about as well, before we get too kind of excited about all this. How do we know any of this? What is our actual, what are our data sources for this? It's very easy to imagine to string together a story of a, you know, a grandiose story of a lost world like this. If there's one thing you have to be very careful with when you're dealing with the deep past, it's excessive arm waving. Very important to have a clear handle on what our data sources are. One of these data sources, incidentally, you've just met in Detlef's very exciting presentation. You have seen how the very, a very careful comparative study of characteristics among extant organisms, in this instance in particular, gene expression profiles and different cell lineages can allow you to draw inferences about the deep past. That's going to be part of the story here too, but there are other sorts of data besides. Hypotheses of relationships are of course absolutely crucial. You've already seen that. They're always based one way or another on shared similarities between organisms. Traditionally, before molecular biology was available to us, this was, of course, done on the basis of morphological characteristics. This is a tradition that goes all the way back to people like Aristotle, Linnaeus, before you know, anybody was even thinking in evolutionary terms. More recently, of course, uh, and I mean, I really had to put this picture up, you know. If, um, 
since the, the, uh, the, the discovery of the genetic code in particular, uh, molecular data has really overtaken morphological data as a tool for phylogenetic reconstruction. And if you're going to look today at the relationships of any of these guys here shown in the pictures, of course you'll do it on the basis of molecular data. However, morphological data retain one key function. Because you see, all these nodes lie, as you can easily work out, millions, indeed in this case hundreds of millions of years in the past. And these branches are awfully long and these organisms are now really very disparate. This is where fossils come in handy. Fossils, I mean, of course, you can have fairly recent fossils, but we're thinking about fossils from kind of the deep past, stuff that's hundreds of millions of years old. They'll tend to occupy deep positions in these branches. They'll break up these long, bare branches and give us crucial information about what's actually happened here in terms of a stepwise assembly of the characteristics that give us these modern organisms today. But, of course, you can only do that if you can position your fossils reasonably securely from phylogenetic data. And, of course, with fossils, with a very few exceptions from you know, very recent times, like you know, mammoths or whatever, which are not very relevant here, uh, you have to stick with morphological data. We have no mo molecular data to go on. And fortunately, although uh, those of you who are familiar with this sort of stuff will be aware that there's a long, the, the, there's a long history now of, 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 in particular, kind of popular science pieces highlighting perhaps conflicts between molecular and morphological phylogenetic data. Uh, Actually, most of the time, they don't conflict badly at all. They tend to be pretty much consonant, which is really pleasing here because it means that when we have organisms like these guys that we can only position on the basis of morphological data, we're not lost. It's not like this is a technique that doesn't work. So we can get a pretty good idea with no doubt the odd slip, but it doesn't really matter basically where these fossil forms go. And that means that we can integrate these two data sources successfully. All right. So that's fine, but what are fossils then, and, and, and what do they tell us? Um, one key point I'm going to flag right now is that while the critters that Detlef was telling you about are, with few exceptions, entirely soft-bodied organisms, and we have some of those in here as well, you'll meet them in a bit, but most vertebrates, and that meant, then means, of course, most fossil vertebrates, have biomineralized tissues. This does make a difference to the quality of an informativeness of the fossil record. I thought we could start looking at, just, I just pull out, you know, a fossil out of the grab bag here. This is a, an early jawless fish, Loganelia, belongs kind of down there. It's an animal with biomineralized tissues. So let's have a look at it. You know, first sight, you'd think, it's not got a lot going for it, really, has it? It's a sort of fish outline on a slab of rock. However, zoom in on something like this, you will find that the dark material here consists of lots of little scales. And if you winkle those scales off of the rock, look at them under the electron microscope, you find that they are really very nicely preserved. What's more, if you section them, you will find that the tissue is preserved. Vertebrate biomineralized tissues consist of calcium phosphate, hydroxyapatite in a, in a protein matrix. And while the, the fine structure is sometimes destroyed by fossilization, more commonly it is not. So what this means is that you can get very detailed information on the histology and therefore, you know, in the form of spaces and stuff, cellular organization, really down to nanoscale, three-dimensionally preserved, even in material like this that's well over 400 million years old. In this instance, we can see that these scales are built of a tissue which is evidently dentine. There's lots of dentine tubules within the, the, the mineralized matrix and it's really not unlike even a section of, of, of dentine out of one of our own teeth. But oddly, these are scales that are covering the outside of the fish. So, you know, immediately we have some information that that's kind of interesting. But, uh, you know, that's a fairly tatty fossil, so you get some much prettier ones. This is an early jawed vertebrate, it's a vertebrate, a placoderm. Put some flesh on it, it will look very similar to this fella up here, um, from a locality in Australia, about 380 million years old. And uh, this has been freed from the rock with, with acetic acid, and it's all very nice. Um, but we can do more than that with them now. There's been a really major technical development 
uh, in uh, vertebrate paleontology as important in its way as the, the advances in, in sequencing and, and um, expression profiling that you have just seen, namely the use of synchrotron microtomography to study fossils. This is a synchrotron. It's the one where I tend to work, the ESRF synchrotron in Grenoble. So it's this great big electron accelerator ring. But the key thing is not the electrons. What you want with this is what the electrons are forced to give off when you kind of send them through wiggly magnetic fields, which is uh, very powerful and in character somewhat laser-like X-rays, synchrotron radiation, which allows you to do a tomographic sensor. I mean, like, you know, the kind of X-ray you might get done on your knee if you've injured it or whatever, but with very high resolutions. Let's have a little look at the shoulder girdle of one of these things. A single slice image from such a study can look like this. This with a linear resolution of about five microns. Model it up, and this is what you see. So this is part of the shoulder girdle of a placoderm from the same locality, model made by my friend and colleague Sophie Sanchez. The exterior of the bone here, don't worry about the lettering, but the exterior of the bone is shown in sort of orangey gold. The core of the bone is shown transparent, except this pink stuff, this cat's cradle sort of fuzz of stuff, these are all blood vessel spaces within the bone. So very nice preservation, three dimensions. Let's zoom in a bit further. This from a higher resolution scan. So you can see there's a quarter of a millimeter. Um, now you can see in, in sort of pale turquoise here, the cell spaces from the, the, the bone cell lacunae from the interior of the bone muscle fiber attachments. There was a muscle here run up onto the gill arches. And of course, uh, at higher magnification, the, the, the vascular holes. And we can go considerably closer than this if we want to. So the point is that we get a, a, an astonishing amount of, of biological, biologically relevant information out of our fossils with this kind of technique. You'll see a bit more about it later on. One other point before we really sort of dive into the, the core of the story. How can we know how long ago all this stuff happened? We sort of glibly wave around, you know, in terms of hundreds of millions of years. Um, how do we know? In very simple terms, there are two methods for dating the past. Historically, they're, they're, they're kind of separate and we're then very fruitfully brought, brought together. Relative dating is the oldest term. This is, these are sedimentary rocks on the south coast of England, and you can see the layered like this. And if you think about how these are forming, sediments being kind of you know, washed in and settling on the sea floor, it's easy to work out that the ones at the bottom are going to be older than the ones at the top. This is a time sequence. You may also find that these contain different characteristic fossils that change over time. And by using that straightforward technique, it was possible long ago, even before the end of the 19th century, to build up a pretty complete sequence of the geological history of the Earth with named periods and all, but with no actual dates, of course, except it must have been an awful long time ago. However, there's another technique. If you uh, get volcanic rocks, you know, they're erupted as lava, then the, and then the lava sets, um, they contain certain proportions of radioactive elements that break down at known rates. This, of course, is basic physics, and this allows an absolute dating of volcanic rocks. You can actually work out in you know, millions of years exactly how long ago this volcanic rock formed. Now, what, every so often, you'll have something like this. There's a sequence of sedimentary rocks like those I showed on the south coast of England, but here, within them, a volcanic ash fall. So that can be given an absolute date, and it can be tied into the relative date sequence that we have for the strata of sediments. So using this technique over decades, researchers all over the world have managed to build up a detailed time scale like this for the whole history of the Earth with really quite finely constrained dates for various events. And um, the um, time frame that we're going to be looking at in, in my talk is starting about there and running up to about here. Okay, so with that put in place, let's start to get into the meat of the story, beginning with the origin of the vertebrates. Questions to consider then are, you know, which are the closest living relatives of the vertebrates? What were the earliest vertebrates like and where and when did they live? So that's the same sun. So we can see here's the, the remainder of the tree kind of compressed. We've now gone a little bit further down. We find two groups here that are of interest, two extant groups, the Eurochordates, Unicates or sea squirts, um, 
doesn't look like anything much, does it? Except it, there's a certain sort of cuteness to this one. A sort of, there's a sort of Hello Kitty aesthetic to it with the little you know, frilly bits and all. But, um, and then the rather more to look at, rather more fish-like Kefla chordates. This is Amphioxus or Branchiostomus is its proper Latin name. Um, these are our two closest relatives among modern non-vertebrate groups. They're both marine filter feeders. They have lots of gill slits. You can see them very clearly in Amphioxus here. In, in the tunicate, they're kind of hidden inside the animal. This is the pharynx, so the, the, like the throat region with, with hundreds or sometimes thousands of gill slits. Um, they have no, well, it's probably not quite true from, a, from, from sort of Detlef's perspective, but they don't have much of a brain anyhow. It's kind of organized, but it's not really, I mean, if you look at the Amphioxus, for example, there's a dorsal nerve cord along here, and it just sort of ends. It has an internal organization, but it doesn't even like, you know, bulk out properly. Certainly, they don't have any paired sense organs of the type that we have. They, haven't, they have light sensitivity, but no image-forming eyes. They, they don't, don't have, have inner ears. ears. They, they don't, don't have... Um, an or, a, a pair of organized nasal sacs, and there, there are no fins. Um, these guys as adults just sort of sit around, attached, um, but they have a larval stage with a notochord and a tail, and in, in cephalochordates, things look like this, you know, all through life. The, all vertebrates differ from these guys in a number of respects. We still have the gill slits, I mean, of course, in, you know, tetrapod, they're not so obvious in, in, in the adult stage where they have remnants of them. But gill slits are always present at some stage in development, at least. But in addition, vertebrates have a substantially expanded brain. We have these paired sense organs. All vertebrates have a pair of inner ears, a pair of image-forming eyes, unless they're kind of degenerated, um, and a pair of nasal sacs. We have a heart, and we have red oxygen-carrying blood with hemoglobin. So there's a distinct suggestion. If you think about this, what these sort of characteristics mean, they suggest that we, at this point, became considerably more active and somehow more aware than these guys. These people just sort of sit around and filter feed. Amphioxus is typically described as free swimming, but what that means is that if you, po is that if you poke it, it sort of goes for a bit and then it settles down again. Um, they spend most of the time semi-buried in the sediment, just kind of poking out the head end and, and, and filter feeding. Um, Vertebrates do rather more than that. So this much we can easily deduce from, from comparing extant forms. But what about the fossil record? The earliest known fossil vertebrates we have appear during the Cambrian period, about 520 million years ago, as part of this mysterious phenomenon called the Cambrian explosion, where a wide diversity of animal groups either originate or at least, let's say, become visible in the fossil record within a very tight time frame. Um, two genera have been quite nicely described in recent years, Hycoichthys from China and the marginally younger Metasprigina from the uh, Burgess Shale of Canada. Hycoichthys has, and by the way, so these are non-mineralized animals, and the fossils really consist of, it's organic material preserved, pretty much as kind of, you know, color shades on the rock. They're not easy to study, but when you have numerous specimens, you don't do too badly. The eyes tend to preserve well. This is one of those curious things. Um, it seems to be the melanin at the back of the retina that preserves well. It's, it's a well-known phenomenon with, with, with uh, vertebrate fossils that if you, the, the soft tissue that most easily pre preserves, even if you have nothing else, is the, the black of the eyes. Melanin has very good preservation potential. What we can see in these is a pair of eyes and some little nasal sacs in between, and apparently also inner ears here, although they don't tend to preserve as well. Um, there's enough information about these to allow a reasonable sort of body reconstruction. Color, of course, is completely conjectural, but it kind of looks nice. Um, if we go to Metasprigina, the material is slightly better. Um, it's easier to make, make out what's going on. Slightly different shape of the head here with the eyes right at the very front end. It's, the animal's been reconstructed looking like this. So if we look at these in particular, if we allow for a little bit of artist license in both cases, you can see they're pretty similar animals. And really, they look rather like lancelets, but with proper heads. 
we are clearly right at the beginning of vertebrate evolution. They likely belong just below the basal node, the last common ancestor of all living vertebrates. They inhabited a very strange world. We had had during the, the Cambrian explosion a, a wild radiation of different protostome groups, in other words, arthropods and related things, some of which look fairly conventional, like little Morella here, and then you have kind of living nightmares like Anomalocris here, which are about yay big, uh, and with kind of claws and a bad attitude at the front end, uh, as well as early representatives of various worm groups that are still around today. Vertebrates are a very minor part of these faunas. One thing about them, though, primitive though they are, and perhaps unimpressive to you, both genera have an attribute that has proved to be very, very important in vertebrate evolution. They have a particular style of segmented body musculature. You can see the sediments here somewhat degraded, but quite nicely preserved, nevertheless, in a specimen of Metasprigina. They are the same body segments that give this kind of curious stripiness to salmon steaks. Um, the beauty with this setup is of course you've got a brain here, spinal cord, and by firing waves of nervous impulses down the spinal cord that set off sequential contractions in these muscles, left and right, you get the body to be thrown into this kind of classic swimming motion that's so familiar from, from fishes. This is actually an extremely efficient mode of swimming, uh, considerably better than any sort of paddling with legs or whatever, because essentially you're never really working against yourself. There's no, as it were, counterstroke that's slowing you down. Um, and it's been, I think, a major success story, or a major reason for the success of aquatic vertebrates ever since. So, okay, here we are. We've got some vertebrate attributes, a head, brain, paired sense organs, a heart, and red blood. Um, if we look at the deepest branch among the extant vertebrates, the cyclostomes, we can see what this kind of means for an animal. Um, these are jawless vertebrates. They've got no jaws, no mineralized tissue, no paired fins. There are basically two models of these. There are hagfish and lampreys. Hagfishes are really important marine scavengers. You, you know, you look at something like this and it's kind of, it suggests itself as some sort of, you know, basal relic that is now going to be very rare and, you know, not ecologically important. This is actually very far from the truth. Um, what you're seeing here is what's called a whale fall. If, you know, whales kind of big things. Whale dies, sinks to the bottom of the ocean. Now it's lying down there, kind of, you know, three kilometers down. What's going to happen to it? Well, it'll get eaten. And it gets eaten very substantially by hagfish. In this picture, they may be difficult to make out, but there they are. There are some of them, at least. This whole thing is swarming with hagfish. They're actually a really important part of the, the, uh, the marine food chain. Um, sort of... Eat, eel-shaped animals, their, their eyes are quite reduced. You can see the mouth here, there's, there are no jaws, but what you do have is a rasping tongue that can be protruded and suddenly makes the thing look quite nightmarish when it sort of comes in to take a bite. So the tongue sort of splits into two halves with these rasping things. I've labeled them as teeth in inverted commas because they're actually horny structures. They're not actually, they're not mineralized. Single nostril in the middle of the face. Lampreys. Um, a related group are ectoparasites, principally on fish. They have this sort of sucker attached to themselves, and the rasping tongue now rasps a hole in the skin of the fish and allows the, the, the lamprey to consume body fluids. Incidentally, and this is a, you know, don't try this at home, children, but a friend of mine actually tested this once. Um, he's a Polish guy. Um, you'll meet him later in the talk, and he decided he'd caught a lamprey. And he thought, well, you know, what happens if you actually put this thing on your arm? And he says, he didn't feel a damn thing. It's got some sort of local anesthetic in its saliva. So he thought, well, you know, nothing much has happened here. And then he had realized the thing had already drawn blood. Anyway, so, um, yes, be careful with lampreys. But, they, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of engaging animals in their own way, anyhow. Um, the earliest fossil lamprey is 360 million years old, but this group must go back more than 500 million, without a doubt. So there we are. Um, but I now want to continue moving up the tree. About 500 million years ago, it seems, at the end of the Cambrian period, a really major innovation occurred in one group of early vertebrates. And we know that because in the fossil record, we start finding things like this. If you take 
limestone from this period, and you dissolve it in acetic acid. Limestone is calcium carbonate. Vertebrate hard tissues, calcium phosphate. If you use weak acetic acid to dissolve the limestone, it doesn't affect the calcium phosphate, and things like this pop out. This is a piece of very early vertebrate armor belonging to a genus called Anatolipe. It's the earliest known armored vertebrate. And in fact, this is a composite of two tissues. We've got bone, but also in uh, pink here, we have dentine. In other words, the core material in your teeth. We tend to think of dentine, of course, as, as a tooth tissue. So it's ivory, basically, if you express it on a large scale. But we know now, without much doubt, that the dentine actually originated in the skin, as in fact did bone, although in a slightly deeper layer of the skin. And if you look at a modern day shark, such as this guy here, um, you know, they have this curious sort of sandpapery texture on the outside. It's, this actually consists of little teeth, all of which are made of dentine and have neat little pulp cavities. These are uh, so-called placoid scales. And this is a retained primitive characteristic that you see in modern sharks. This thing here from the Ordovician of Bolivia, so maybe 480 or so million years old, is a thing called Sacabambaspis. And it's, what's nice about it is that it is the oldest near complete bony vertebrate. There's, a, you know, bits are missing from this actual specimen, but it's still quite nice material. You can see eyes at the front of the head, like car headlights, again, rather like Metasprigina, um, but in this case, the whole fish is covered in bone with dentine on top, forming big plates and scales further back along the body. Total size of this thing, about so. Over the following about 100 million years, um, there was a flowering of these strange, armoured, jawless fishes. Some of them, as you can see, had pectoral fins, others did not. The thing about this is that although these are jawless forms, they are not, as far as we can tell, related to the extant jawless vertebrates. These are the stem to the jawed vertebrates. Their possession of these biomineralized tissues, these are features that are shared with, with us, um, that are not present in the, the extant jawless group. By the way, one of the things that my research group is really focusing on now is the origin and early evolution of these tissues because we have the potential here to really understand the emergence of the, um, the, 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 the range of hard tissues that you see in extant vertebrates um, with uh, the inclusion of a range of sort of early versions that are no longer present in, in, in anything living, uh, and this is really quite informative. In particular, as we can begin to cross-correlate here to a degree with the genetic basis for these tissues. So well and good, we've not got bone and dentine, we've got pectoral fins, but another big innovation was coming, jaws, of course, and with jaws, teeth. It's made a big difference to what vertebrates were able to do. Um, jaws are, in essence, modified gill arches, and teeth appear to be modified dentine scales. Now, a little perceptual trick here. This will tell you a little bit about how the human mind works. These are difficult to make sense of, aren't they? I mean, admit it, it's not easy to see what's going on. Much easier? <laughs> Thought so. Once you know where the eye is, the whole of the rest falls into place, doesn't it? This is a modern day shark. This is um, an early fossil shark. Um, just chosen because it shows very elegantly how little different the jaws and this thing, the hyoid arch, which in us goes partly into the mid and partly into the tongue base, how little different they are from gill arches to start with. Interestingly, this same material goes to make the rasping tongue in those uh, jawless extant forms. But this, is, this condition, if anything, is probably closer to the ancestral gill arch. Jawed vertebrates not only have jaws, we also almost always, unless they have been lost, like in snakes, have two pairs of paired appendages, pectoral and the pelvic, which of course can be specialized into different roles and thereby provide further options, as it were, for vertebrates in, in terms of activity and so on. We also have a, a, a more elaborate inner ear than the jawless vertebrates with three rather than two semicircular canals. The jawless forms, you remember, had either no paired appendages at all or just one pair. Okay, so we're assembling our body plan quite nicely here. 
We can summarize this first 100 million years, approximately, of vertebrate evolution in these sort of terms. You start out with these fairly static filter feeders with, frankly, limited ambitions in life um, to you go through to, to act more active, more aware, free-swimming filter feeders, and further on to evidently even more active and even more aware, because you have sensory elaboration here as well, free-swimming predators. You really have quite a dramatic change in terms of the, the, um, the sort of eco-space the organism is going to occupy and the range of options that it has in life. Just a very quick look at sharks. Of course, sharks are familiar to everyone. There's an idea floating around that I think is, is quite widely established and which many of you may have come across, that sharks are somehow rather primitive extant uh, jawed vertebrates. Is this really the case? To zoom in, to, 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 to answer this question, let's zoom in a bit on this part of the tree and I'll put on some fossil forms here. Um, the so-called placoderms, early armored jawed fishes. You've seen this guy already. Um, these are the most primitive known jawed vertebrates. I'm very heavily engaged with research in these at the moment. We've had quite a, quite a few papers out over the last couple of years describing materials, some, some of it from Canada, some of it from China, um, that give together a very good idea about the anatomy and the character transformations. You see right at the base of the jawed vertebrates. And interestingly, this is what comes out. You know, sharks belong here. They are, as it were, the deepest branch among the extant jawed vertebrates, but they are not really primitive in many respects at all. In most regards, it's the bony fishes and even we ourselves that have retained more of the placoderm character complement. But this is still a story that's developing. I've got new data on the origin of jaws and teeth kind of brewing in the lab at the moment, which hopefully will come out and make a little bit of a splash over the next year or so. Incidentally, you will be hearing more about fishes uh, in, in a following lecture um, from Professor Venkatesh, who's in the audience today. So I'm not going to dwell on them really heavily, but I want to show you a little bit about how we're actually working on these things. A lot of the work I've been doing in this, this uh, area has been on the basis of uh, synchrotron microtomography. I already mentioned it, but, but you know, okay, but how does that actually look? This is the skull of an early placoderm, Romandina. Here is a single slice image out of a scan of this thing that we did, voxel size, basically resolution, just over seven microns. But what does that actually give you in the end? What can you do with something like this? Can't have a talk like this with our animation. So I thought, let's lift the lid on Romandina and see what's inside. What you find in a creature like this is that the, the spaces that once contained the brain and inner ears and so on are all lined with a thin layer of bone. There's a bit of damage here, but we can ignore that. It's easy enough to make out the anatomy anyhow, which will allow you then with a little bit of kind of, you know, mirror imaging here to, to, to uh, repair the damage and filling in vessels and nerves where we can see grooves for them, allow us to actually reconstruct the cranial anatomy really quite nicely. And of course, because these are 3D models, you can then also animate them quite, quite sweetly. Uh, at the time this model was made, this is the most detailed representation of the internal cranial anatomy of an early jawed vertebrate that had been made. We've since gone a, you know, a little better than this, but this is quite nice. Optic nerve there, inner ear, um, various blood vessels. This is the jugular vein canal and so on. The point I want to make, apart from the fact that it's kind of nice and it's swirling around, is that we really get a very detailed understanding of the anatomy of these animals by working with this kind of technique. And this, of course, then also allows for more accurate inferences, not only about relationships, but about the, the evolution of, of particular structures. And indeed, sometimes you can make very, some of these features are, are, are reliable proxies for, for example, the boundaries between dis different cell populations, allowing you to draw quite, quite detailed inferences in a sort of evo-devo domain. It's coming at the evo-devo uh, sphere of interest, as you were, from the opposite end, if you like, compared to uh, what Detlef was telling you about. All right. From the late Silurian, call it about 420 million years ago, fishes diversified rapidly, becoming more abundant, becoming bigger, becoming 
altogether more complicated and eventually, of course, taking us to the kind of world that we have today where aquatic ecosystems are, if not dominated, then certainly very strongly influenced by vertebrates. Vertebrates are abundant and diverse and also, of course, some of the biggest animals in there. But there's more to the story, of course. We're missing something here. While our backs have been turned, we haven't been following what's happening on the land. So let's go back to that for a bit. Let's backtrack to around here and think about what the world was like at this time. We've already seen that the seas were strange places, but that's nothing compared to the land, which basically looked like this. Um, with, uh, certainly there were terrestrial ecosystems, but essentially they were microbial in moist places. Other than that, the land was basically barren. Starting uh, maybe 480 or so million years ago in the Ordovician, we start finding spores of land plants in the fossil record. Apparently the earliest ones from forms rather like the modern day liverworts. And then things rolled on rather quickly. Vascular plants, which can grow much taller, evolved uh, during the Silurian period. This is one of the earliest. It's a, a, an early lycopod, club moss, Baragwanathia from Australia. It's a living representative of the same group. By the middle of the Devonian period, so like 390 million years ago, you had tree-sized plants with woody trunks, and the world was looking very different. Now you're starting to get ecosystems with macroscopic organisms, some of which are just bizarre, like here's our prototaxitis again. A fungus the size of one of the saguaro cactuses you see in Western films. There's no doubt there are more things in here that are even stranger than that. We can't even yet begin to imagine. But suffice it to say that along with all these static organisms, along came animals as well. Among the earliest evidence we have is a series of trackways from this, what's called the Tumblagouda sandstones in Calbarri in Western Australia. Here you have them, they're probably Silurian in age, great big tracks of what are probably sea scorpions or Eurypterids moving on land. What about vertebrates then? If we look at the vertebrates today, I mean, of course, we've got our land vertebrates, but looking a little further down the tree, we find that there are several groups of ray-finned fishes that live partly on land, but have never really become permanently established there. We've got things like the walking catfish, Clarius, mud skippers, you can go and see these around the shores of Singapore, the climbing perch. But none of these are anything to do with the origin of land vertebrates of our group. To understand that, we need to look in a different part of the tree, this segment here. So let's expand this branch segment. Now we find a couple of new groups you haven't previously seen, coelacanths and lungfishes. These are the extant lobe-finned fishes. First appear in the fossil record about 410 million years ago. Both groups have limb-like fins. Lungfishes also have functional lungs. Coelacanths today have a remnant of a lung. Coelacanths are marine fishes, living at typically at a depth of about 100 to 200 meters. This one is in a somewhat shallower setting, hence the diver. Um, there's only a single living genus, Latimeria, which occurs in the Indian Ocean. Um, there are known to occur as close to here as Sulawesi, who knows what might actually be present in the waters of Singapore itself. Anyhow, extremely conservative living fossils, if you like, which have changed very little over time. This is a 325 million year old coelacanth from a locality in North America, and you can see immediately that it has this same curiously shaped symmetrical tail, exactly the same as you see in the modern Latimeria. Lungfish is unlike coelacanths living in tropical freshwaters today. Um, th there are three living genera in, in Australia, this is the Australian form, South, South America and Africa. They breathe air, they seem very amphibian-like. So one might reasonably ask whether these are, are these really like almost like surviving tetrapod ancestors? Are they retaining the characters that our earliest uh, ancestors that transitioned onto land actually have, had? Oh, well, the answer is no. Curiously, the very earliest fossil lungfishes, like Gryphonathus there, um, are found in unambiguously marine environments, such as coral reefs. In fact, this one comes from the very same locality as that big placoderm that you saw the previous synchrotron images of. This is the bit of the tree where things get really interesting. So if we zoom in on that a bit, we have 
this, of course, is quite simplified. You'll understand there's quite a lot more tax I could put on. But basically, down here, we have a bunch of fish, so which I pulled out a representative form, Eustonopteron. Then we have these two genera, Pandrichthys from Latvia, Tiktaalik from Arctic Canada, and then you start to get into actual limbed vertebrates. So if we start with these guys, Eustonopteron is one of these animals that constantly features in popular science books and occasionally even as little plastic modeling cornflakes packets as the heroic fish that conquered the land. We've all seen these pictures. Curious thing is there's really no basis for them at all. Um, this became a sort of meme in terms of popular paleontology because when uh, the uh, good material of this thing became available during the mid-early part of the 20th century and was described in great detail by a researcher at the Natural History Museum in Stockholm, Eric Jarvik. Beautiful material, clearly something that was sort of, you know, related to tetrapods. That's evident anatomically. And so the idea became established that this itself must be some kind of tr transitional form. In fact, look at it. I mean, it's a fish. You know, it's a really quite conventional-looking pike-like predatory fish with anatomical traits suggesting a certain kinship to tetrapods. But we move up from there to these guys, things get a lot more interesting. You can see immediately that you're looking at animals with a different sort of shape. Pandarichthys comes principally from Latvia, from a region that's a, a, at the time a large delta, kind of like the Ganges Delta of today. Tiktaalik from riverine environments in Arctic Canada. Both lived approximately about 380 million years ago Pandrix is a little earlier than Tiktaalik. They look like this. Both large predators. Tiktaalik here apparently up to two and a half meters in length, judging by the largest fragments. Pandrix is a tad smaller. A kind of, they look like kind of weird crosses between fishes and crocodiles, don't they? They have this sort of oddly crocodile-like shape, eyes on top of the head, strong pectoral fins at the front, perhaps for a kind of mudskipper-like movement over land. The shape issue is interesting. Uh, we've, many of us have been kind of thinking on this for some years. There was a recent paper by, by uh, MacIver et al. that finally did a more kind of seriously quantitative analysis on this, demonstrating that the eyes in, the, in these things not only move on top of the head, but start to get larger proportionately compared to what you see in, in related fishes. And this only really makes sense as an adaptation to aerial vision. You would gain very little by making your eyes bigger in a freshwater environment where the maximum distance you can see is really not all that great. Um, this feature persists into early tetrapods. This is an undescribed one. I'm currently working up with a colleague in Russia. You can see you've got this remarkably caiman-like head shape. Now, this is interesting because, in other words, we have these forms that are, in other respects, still quite fish-like. As you will see, they've still got tail fins and stuff. Um, but they are interested in what's going on in the aerial environment. Or one imagines, perhaps, up on the bank. What's the story? Are they kind of lunging out and grabbing arthropods that are walking along? We don't really know. But it's some sort of pointer to the likely mode of life. I've mentioned the pectoral fins already. Uh, this is what the internal skeleton looks like in Panerichthys and Tiktaalik. Uh, not all that different. Um, and quite, quite comparable in organization to our own. There's a, an upper arm bone, a humerus, and a radius and ulna in the forearm, and so on. And in fact, we can put on um, a human arm there. You'll see they're really not that different. One interesting thing, though, look at these two bones. You can easily see that in Pandarichthys, this one's long, that's the ulna, and that one's short. In Tiktaalik, they're kind of similar in length. Now, evidently, this is more like what you see in a limb, because look, you know, very long ulna, very short ulna, it's just a little diddy bit there, but if you remember two slides back, and I hope at least some of you do, that doesn't match with the pattern of the tree. Apparently, you know, and on good grounds, I should say, on other characteristics, Tiktaalik's a bit higher up. I want to flag this because, you know, it's so easy to make a kind of terribly pat and neat story about this, as though there are no conflicts in terms of your interpretation. Actually, that's rarely the case once you get into the details. Um, we evidently have a more limb-like fin in this somewhat deeper taxon, a less limb-like fin here. So what's the story? Is this convergent on, on, on a tetrapod condition, perhaps indicating independent acquisition of greater terrestriality? Or has that one kind of reverted to a more fishy condition? Or is it the tree that's wrong? Are the branch, should the branches flip? We really don't know. In very general terms, no doubt this structure is correct. But, you know, the details are fuzzier than one might like to think. 
But anyhow, leaving these guys aside and moving a little way up, we get to the tetrapods of the Devonian period, the earliest known vertebrates with limbs. The first material of this sort of age was discovered by a series of uh, Swedish-Danish expeditions in the mid part of the 20th century, proper expeditions with sailing ships and dangerous little aeroplanes and stuff, not like, you know, nowadays. Um, they found a couple of genera, a lot of specimens of this animal, Ichthyostega, skull there, it's the same skull, tail and a hind limb. They also found the second form called Acanthostega, which very little material was available initially, but where in 1987, when I was a PhD student with questionable taste in hats, this is my PhD supervisor, Jenny Clack, and two colleagues from, from Copenhagen, we found a very rich locality for the second genus and were able to dig out a lot of material. Here we are actually excavating at the site. That's the camp. Vertical distance is more than 800 meters. It used to take us four hours to climb up here, but worth the trouble because we've got specimens like this that allowed us to pull together a reconstruction like this. I should say immediately the wildest figure is actually from Alberg et al. 2005. What Alberg did, he was put together a skull reconstruction and a body reconstruction already produced by our colleague Michael Coates, who actually did much of the work on this. So, you know, this is a bit fraudulent, but never mind. Um, suffice it to say, we have a bunch of novelties here. We have digits on the limbs instead of, of paired fins an enlarged pelvis that's now attached to the back bone so that we can support the body on the hind limbs, as of course, you know, we still do. Um, remarkably, the feet of Acanthostega have eight digits. One of the really big discoveries out of this, and it puts these animals squarely, as it were, outside the box, if you like, of later tetrapods. We also got from material collected on the same trip, more new information about Ichthyostega. This is how it had been reconstructed by uh, its original discoverers. We now know that it looks rather more like this with a regionalized vertebral column. You see how the change of the vertebrae changes as you go along? Curious, is this rather like what you see in a mammal? Very surprising for such, a, such an early land vertebrate. The third form, Ventostega, that uh, which um, I discovered, along with colleagues in Latvia, very different locality, this sand. We're digging in unconsolidated river sand that's more than 360 million years old. If you want to collect early tetrapod material with a bread knife, this is where you go. And very lovely the material is when it comes out. A rather a canthostega-like creature, though not as complete. All right, so we, you know, we start to get what seems to be a straightforwardly coherent picture of these sorts of animals. And if we put all of this on a time scale, then we can see we have the, the Elpistostegids, as we call them, Tiktaalik and Pandorichthys and the like down here. And then up here, we get forms like Ventostega. Elginerpton, which, you, which, which Ballard mentioned early on, comes down here. So, all right, the origin of tetrapods is going to be somewhere in there, isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it? No. It's actually there. Okay. How do we know that? Well, this is a locality in Poland, Zahelmia Quarry, well-dated, early middle Devonian locality, which yields, what's on these blocks, why are people so excited? It's because we're finding tetrapod trackways. Very nicely preserved tetrapod footprints. This is perhaps the best, and we have other good specimens, I should say, this by no means the only one, with a very nice, clean set of digit impressions. These are 30 million years older than that Greenland material, and amazingly, they're 8 million years older than Pandorichthys. This did make a bit of a splash, but it's also an interesting illustration of you know, the problems of presenting kind of radical stuff in science, because we've had a very well bimodal response to this. Some people are very excited, some people still simply refuse to accept that it's true. They're just sort of going, no, God, it must be something else. Something else. That's a nice kind of flexible category, you know, it's, it's infinitely flexible. In fact, it, the tracks must have been made by something else. Fine, make a suggestion. What would it have been that would have big appendages like this with, like, you know, things on the ends? But in any case, Zahelmia isn't even the only known locality. There is another slightly late locality from, from Ireland, cycle Valencia Island, showing very similar trackways that are about the same age as Pandorichthys. So, you know, the story holds up. And in fact, when you start comparing the foot morphology with what we know from Ichthyostega, really very similar. There's nothing strange about this stuff, except perhaps one thing. Look at the scale bar. That's one centimeter. Oh, big feet. The biggest of these footprints, assuming anything like kind of conventional proportions, suggest an early tetrapod of about this sort of size roughly the size of a smallish modern crocodile. So what does this actually tell us? 
What does it mean for the origin of tetrapods? It's important to appreciate that it doesn't do anything to the tree, the tree topology. This branching pattern is really quite well supported. It's morphological, but you know, there's a good morphological data set. There's really nothing to suggest that this isn't true. What it must mean is that this whole bit of the backbone and these nodes lie further back in time than we have imagined, and that this branch, and you know, following the tetrapod bit of the tree, coexisted for quite a while with these sorts of guys. In itself, there's nothing implausible about that. We have other examples of that in the fossil record, like early birds coexisting alongside feathered dinosaurs. And in fact, if you look at modern day uh, an intertidal ecology, we have a bit of a model that might explain this sort of thing. Mudskippers, right, again, you know, lovely animals. Of course, the thing is there are quite a lot of different kinds of mudskippers. And they have different ecological preferences. Here we have two of them, periophthalmus, right up there in the mangroves, really quite a terrestrial animal. Boliophthalmus here, which is an algal grazer out on the mudflats, lower down in the shore. It's not implausible that tetrapods and uh, transitional forms like tiktaalik could have divided their ecospace in a comparable manner during this time period. Even so, of course, we still have a problem. Where the heck are the bodies of the middle Devonian tetrapods? How can it be that we have no good record of, uh, in fact, no skeletal record of these forms at all. Are we okay there? There we go. And surprises keep coming. Um, recently, we've been applying. Okay. Thanks very much for coming. We've recently been applying synchrotron microtomography to looking at the histology of the limb bones of this acanthus material. Almost all of it comes from a single mass death occurrence, a, a shoal of these things that got trapped in a drying river channel uh, in a sort of Okavango inland delta type environment. What do we find? The darn things are juveniles. We can tell because you don't see the slowing down of growth that always comes at sexual maturity in, in you know, most any vertebrate, in, humans included. It looks like we've never actually seen an adult Acanthus tiger. We really don't know what these animals are going to be like as adults. So this story is less complete than we might have thought. All right, if we summarize early vertebrate evolution, we can find that, all right, we've already seen the story of the first 100 million years, drastic changes like this. What about the next period? Let's look at the next 50 million years. We're getting up into this part of the tree. So we're already starting with free swimming predators. And we get to more free swimming predators, rather a lot of different ones, and then we take them onto the land and they become free walking predators. In other words, the anatomical transformation during this period is nowhere near as radical as was going on within the earlier time frame. Um, we basically have a sort of bio plan here that we just stick with. But the ecological impact is considerable already at that time, and if you look forward in time, absolutely incalculable. Because we're looking here at the birth of the modern groups, and in the following millions of years, we get two great radiations. We have the modern fish radiation of modern cartilaginous and bony fishes, which I've alluded to briefly, and of course we have on land the tetrapod radiation. Once the tetrapods were established on land, they underwent principally really a physiological and a morphological diversification that produced herbivores, first plant-eating vertebrates. Is hurting. Eating plants is kind of, you know, plants don't run away. You'd think this is an easy, easy way to earn a living, but plants, in fact, tend to be indigestible, difficult to deal with. Um, it took a good while for herbivory to evolve. We saw, eventually, the evo evolution of endotherms, flying vertebrates, and curiously, of course, Tetrapods have also gone back into the oceans and become an important part of the oceanic ecosystem. Our entire world has really been shaped by these two grand radiations. So much of what we now take for granted is the product of these radiations, including, of course, ourselves and what we have done to our world. So what have we learned then? from this little survey of vertebrate evolution. 
Well, to understand vertebrate evolution, we need data from both fossil and extant vertebrates. Unfortunately, we've got that in some abundance. You can see that the fossil record is both more informative and more incomplete than you might think. Where are the middle Devonian tetrapods, for heaven's sakes? We'll have to find them sometime. Um, the first 100 million years or so of vertebrate evolution created a radically novel animal with sensory, cognitive, and locomotory capabilities far different from those of their filter-feeding ancestors. All of subsequent vertebrate evolution has involved really adapting this basic plan to different lifestyles and environments. There have been major physiological and morphological and behavioral and et cetera changes, but the time of grand anatomical in innovation really seems to be over. There is, of course, a great deal left to discover, especially as regards the interplay between the molecular and phenotypic realms. In other words, the, the, the area uh, uh, where Detlef is working, there's of, course, there's, of course, much work in this sort of domain happening also with invertebrates now, and in the fossil record of early vertebrate evolution, which is really not well understood. And as a final point, and this, again, has already been made by the previous speaker, but I'll make it again because I think it's a very important one. Vertebrate evolution, like any other evolution, is not a story of linear progress. Darwin had it right from the beginning with his very first phylogenetic tree. This is exactly how things actually go. Uh, this is not the story, even though it's an appealing kind of image. I just want to put this up. This is a blue whale. It's the largest animal on the planet today. It is possibly the largest animal ever to inhabit this planet. It's a mammal. It's a product of a very complicated evolutionary history. It's got biomineralized tissues and a big brain and, and you know, paired appendages and the whole thing. But when this guy, and here it is feeding on krill, that's what all the kind of speckle is. When this majestic whale eventually dies and sinks to the bottom, it will be consumed by hagfish the most basal members of the vertebrates, really, that we still have. Phylogenetically deep, very simple creatures, but very abundant and important part of the, the oceanic ecosystem. There is another twist to this as well, because what have we got here? We have a free-swimming filter feeder with a post tail and a vertebral column, you know, allows it to wiggle along. For all its sophistication, for all of the long, long evolutionary history that this is a product of, what it has done essentially is retrieve and re, um, repurpose or reconfigure a mode of life we met long ago at the very base of, the vertebrate, of vertebrate evolution and represented still today by creatures like the lancelet. I will stop there. I hope you found it an interesting journey and of course I'll be very happy to discuss any of these points further. Thank you.